Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Adifisayo Akisoya. I'm the acting head of marketing communications department of Action Microfinance Bank, and would like to welcome you to another episode of Action webinar series. Today, we have with us the lead partner of Theme Professional Services in the person of Mrs. Vivian Chigoze Mon. And I actually hope I, I pronounced her last name properly. She yes, will we be did. sharing insights on how business and entrepreneurs can thrive amidst the crisis. You know, business owners, what can we do differently? How can we manage our costs? You know, if I have um, a loan running with the bank, what am I supposed to do? My income has reduced because, of course, there's been a reduction in my sales. How can I manage that? How can I ensure that I don't go underwater? She's going to be sharing our insights with us very shortly. Um, so, Vivian is the co-founder and lead partner at Bain Professional Solutions and trustee at the MSME Crowd Funding Foundation. Bain Professional Solutions is a technology-focused tax, audit, advisory, and people services firm. In addition to rendering tax, sorry, thank you, but in addition to entering traditional tax, accounting, and auditing services, BIM uses both own and third party apps to solve end to end business problems. Some of their works include the first professional service firm in Nigeria to be engaged by the FIRS to write and publish tax technical articles for the education of taxpayers in a national newspaper. The first professional service firm to develop an app on Android and iOS, the tax law book, that compiles all the Nigerian tax laws and regulations in a mobile app for ease of reading, understanding, and navigation. Being talent assist, a people web application assists talent in job recruitment, HR management, and other talent issues. Then they've also partnered with the Click Church in providing business advisory and tax training for Catholic MSMEs in their respective parishes. The MSME Crowdfunding Foundation trains crowdfunds and old entrepreneurs and operates a crowdfunding platform which is a, which you can um, locate at www.fundandenterprise.org. Thank you so much Vivian for joining us today. Um, I, I, I really appreciate you taking out time from the busy schedule to join us. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you're staying safe. Thank you Fisayo. I'm really glad to be here. Um, and thank you for that introduction and then um, really welcome everyone who is here you can see in quite a huge number of participants at today's webinar you guys thank you for leaving whatever you're doing to come on board and we hope that the insights we'll share will be very impactful and it will worth your time so um, like Fisayo said we're going to be discussing how to navigate the impact of COVID-19 for our businesses, particularly for MSMEs. So we're going to be talking about where the economy is going at this time, the effect of um, the COVID-19 on MSMEs and our businesses, and um, what lessons have we learned? What should we do better so that our businesses can cope better, can survive the impact, can grow better afterwards? What are the things that we thought Many of us during this lockdown were thinking, oh, if only I had done this, maybe this would have been better, or maybe this would have been averted at this time. You know, a lot of regrets, a lot of if onlys, a lot of, okay, after this uh, COVID-19, I'll try and do this. So those are the things we'll try to talk about. And there is a new word now that people coined, COVIDnomics. It talks about how to mitigate the impact of um, the COVID-19 on incomes, on assets and on wealth. So that's basically what we'll be talking about for MSMEs in Nigeria. So are they, what are we going to be sharing? What will we cover in this presentation? So we're going to discuss the impact of coronavirus. Where are we coming from? Before we determine where we're going, we have to take a brief look at where we're coming from. What has happened in recent times? Where is the economy coming from? Where are we now? What is happening now with the coronavirus? And then we'll talk about MSME statistics in Nigeria because we are dealing with MSMEs here. Let's even understand ourselves, know how many we are, what are we, what's the definition of MSME, 
what do we have what's the statistics what are we doing currently so from there we'll now talk about okay lessons learned what have we learned what should we do better how should we manage our finances better how are we going to recover how are we going to try after this then we'll conclude and then answer questions any questions you may have okay so coronavirus impact analysis there's a health crisis and this is real because for instance in my children's school over this two months period we've lost about four parents so we were not told whether it's coronavirus but never before have we lost four parents in two months so people are actually dying so in nigeria lagos is the worst hit state we've had 299 deaths these are people dying like two and almost like 300 people dying in how many months two months which is a lot worldwide we have about 377,000 deaths and the, the worldwide figures for coronavirus is 6 million plus, 213 countries impacted. And uh, these countries impacted, we have things like international trade. We have movements that have been impacted. 213 economies impacted, essentially. In Africa, we have 54 African countries. So all the trade going on among the African countries, all the travels, all the relationships, a lot of things have been impacted all the supplies so you can see how uh, critical this period is in africa we have 100 and 144,000 cases 4,000 deaths over 4,000 deaths south africa is the worst hit with 34,000 over 34,000 cases so we can see how serious this is in south south africa and nigeria we have a good relation business relationship or at least if, if we set aside the xenophobia and all the drama, we have relationship, ongoing relationship. So those things have now been halted because we're practicing social distancing and travel bans. And it's really going to affect or is affecting so many businesses. So not only health crisis, we have economic crisis. Before the COVID-19, things were not rosy. The economy was just beginning to come out of recession from 2018-2019 and um, then the presidential committee on ease of doing business, they were doing everything they could, you know, to place Nigeria higher on the World Bank's ranking for ease of doing business. And then we came on to 131 from out of 190 economies. Well, that's maybe that's on book or on paper but what we notice from down down our side is we still have problems with infrastructure we still have problems with electricity good roads good transport systems uh, a business that is running an office you spend so much in overheads you spend so much buying diesel electricity taking care of infrastructure making sure everything is working well you not only um, the resources you're spending you're spending time and these head headaches come. Then you have the issue of credit, lack of credit, lack of finances. You have to practically do everything by yourself. You have to finance your business from your savings or from family or from angel investors. And uh, a, whole, a whole lot of issues that we're facing. But the government was able to achieve something in, in the ease of registration of business because the, you can now go onto the CAC website and get your business registered by yourself. And it's quite easy and fast. That's one of the things that were achieved by the committee. And you also have this, uh, you, we had this ease of mobility then. We had visa on arrival. So people, trade was going on. People could come in, do their business and, and get visa on arrival without much restrictions, especially um, within the African countries. So we were suffering a lot of things then. And uh, we also had high poverty rate. Over 80 million people falling into abject poverty just before the COVID-19, and we know what that means. So if people are poor, they can't spend, and uh, the business, the power of the business to generate incomes also diminishes. So compared to now, so what has happened now? We were in a bad shape before. Now the COVID-19 has come, stopping all movements and, and activities because. Okay, let's say this supply chain is a serious issue because so many of our people and the traders, they would rather travel to see what they're buying. In fact, 
this is also a lesson learned that we should go build reliable networks we should trust more collaborate more because people hardly buy a lot of people who deal in um, large volume trades even people coming from outside nigeria to come and buy export produce agricultural produce they rather come here to see it you know we never get to a time when we can fully say okay you know what i'm not going to travel but i'm going to trade i have contacts there who can help me load what exactly what i want and ship it to my country and i can sell so this all these uh, movement restrictions stopped a lot of things but it's also helped us a bit to realize that we can also meet we can do some things online we can meet online we can host meetings online we can even reduce costs and expenses so but um about buying trading it has really affected trading and um, there's now changing because everybody just stopped spending on on anything that is not unnecessary in fact all the capital expenditure most people just stopped everybody was projecting about okay savings what's going to happen how are we going to um, bridge this shock to the business how are we going to survive how are we going to feed if we're on lockdown people will feed our children will feed what are we going to do how long will this last how long am i going to set aside if people just ceased spending generally except on very very essential items like food medicine transportation and then supplies for those dealing in the local trading so um every other thing was locked up then people are now spending more in technology especially when it enhances um relationship or, or their trade or their business with their suppliers or their customers the people are spending more in data airtime because that's what you use when you cannot meet somebody physically what you do is to talk with the person or to or to share um, messages with the person or to even go on zoom like we are now then we have this um, people are suffering government is suffering or uh, the crude oil prices are going down nobody's paying tax the custom duties that were coming as revenues are also going down because the trade the volumes have reduced even though containers are still docking and, and trading is still going on um, somehow skeletally but not as it used to be and then some people would even leave their goods at the port and you know be, try whether the demo reach they will pay as compared to the money they will use in, in clearing they will deter, they will analyze cost benefit and say you know what let me just hold on a bit before clearing this so government revenues have crashed as well then we have um, people losing jobs or people losing um, pay you have pay cuts because the businesses are not making anything and people's salaries are delayed because um, essentially so many so many businesses msmes particularly in april they didn't make anything except for the people who are into trading of trading in um, food food stocks and maybe medicines other ones who are into service provision and and the rest they didn't quite make much money so um lot job salaries are delayed jobs are threatened and people work from home if you're working from home productivity is diminished because you can only achieve so much the children are at home you are at home we are all stressed up we are all anxious um, uh, the children are anxious too. We need to provide for them. We need to provide a conducive environment for the children to study. Then you have to divide your time between, okay, where, how can I get sanity around my work? And then how can I take care of the children? And then relatives, friends who cannot help themselves. A lot of emotional struggles pulling us here and there, which could impact productivity and effective work from home which we have all suffered and continue to suffer right now. There, there a lot of income yielding activities and businesses closed, were asked to close down or pay from home. Some people cannot do their business. If you're in, in, into um, bar or eatery or, or hairdressing, then before the, before the lifting of the lockdown right now, you couldn't do anything even from home because people won't come to your house to drink. Um, people, won't, many people did not want to go to eateries to buy food. Many people don't want to go to gym, swimming pools. Those things are still closed. And um, even I have been afraid to go to any salon to go and you know let anybody come close to me to to touch 
my hair or anything. So I'm sure a lot of a lot of businesses found themselves in this situation. Then you have uh, then uh, travel bans, closure of airports, activities came to a, a lockdown. Let me just use that word. Sorry. So let's also be mindful that when we're talking about economic crisis, that 80% of economic activities in Africa occurs in the informal sector. And these are the people who live from um, daily sales or sales, from sales to spending. These are the informal sector, are the people whose businesses are not properly structured to know that we need to set aside money for reinvestment, for building wealth, for savings. We're not going to use the same bank account for our business as we use for our personal needs. People just run their businesses, you know, as if it's just their own person. So you pay your bills, you pay church tithes, church donations from your business account. A whole lot of things. You go to your shop, you're coming back, you just dip hand, you carry cash, dip hand in your pocket, just use the cash to buy food stuff for the family. A whole lot of businesses operate that way in Nigeria and, and in Africa. So if if you have if you're running business in the informal sector and you're not structured and you're running your business from um, selling to spending both on household on personal expenditure and on business expenditure you're not structured and when they say lockdown go home you don't have anything to spend you don't have much savings you haven't built more, much wealth you don't have anything to rely on to say okay you know what i have this asset somewhere I have this investment somewhere I can liquidate and use it to to reach the shop. The most of us are caught up in that um, situation. Then um, continuing the financial crisis, we talked about how government is also not making money, uh, making them to revise the budget, propose a revision to the budget because right now they've explained that the deficit is about 4.59 trillion as compared to the initial de deficit of 2.19. So they need to borrow more, government needs to borrow more to be able to bridge the gap, the, def the budget deficit, since incomes and taxes are not coming in, revenues are not coming in. So, and when you borrow, what happens when you borrow? There's a cycle in the economy in the, sh in the short term and in the long term, it begins to affect people because when you borrow, you, you have liquidity at the moment. And if you don't use it for something productive that will generate incomes in the future, at the time you will need to pay back, it becomes an issue. The economy goes into crunch again. So the high lows, high lows from this borrowing is not something that would even encourage businesses or, or the economy to thrive unless they're actually used for infrastructure, something solid that will build wealth and yield incomes in the future. So you have a government also being aggressive with tax. You know, nobody is even paying tax. A whole lot of circulars have been issued on the Finance Act, turning most things around. You know, a lot of stricter measures have been put in, put in place, stricter interpretations of what we thought was like a realization to MSME tax. So right now, you know, everybody is in tax net. FRS is trying its best to also fulfill its man mandate, just like every other business person that is trying to make an income. FRS itself is trying to make an income and is presenting more letters, more circulars. The Minister for Finance just issued two orders in the past week, one for non-residents on digital economy uh, and, and, and on services rendered by non-residents. The other one was on, on VAT, giving specifications to items that are VAT exempt. So even basic food items, they are now saying that basic food items, yes, we said it's exempt in the law. Yes, it's exempt. But when you are selling it in a restaurant or each or event place or hotel, it's not exempt from VAT. You have to charge VAT. That's like, you know, double-edged double, double -edged sword. I don't know how to describe it, but you're giving a relief. It's not a full relief because most food items are sold in all these hotels and eateries and open places. Then they also talked about baby products, you know, that the exempt one is the one that is relate, related to babies of zero to three years old. So those taxes, those baby people dealing in baby products who, you know, before now used to say, okay, we're dealing in baby products is exempt. 
Now the minister has said, if you're selling any baby product that is for a baby above three years, it's not exempt, you have to pay tax. So we need to know, find out and know all these ramifications as well. We, um, we did a master class on those last week. But that's just to say how aggressive the um, government has become. So we talk about palliatives. We've talked about palliatives for MSMEs. Uh, not many people, I, I really I haven't heard anyone in my circle or closer to me who has applied, who, who has gotten the money. But um, the National Bank is saying that they, they've given out loans, but I haven't heard or seen anybody. So, and then the one of ca conditional cash transfers to households. Um, we all know the drama around it. I don't need to go into it. It's not getting to, essentially, these things are not getting to the people they are supposed to get to. So we find ourselves, individuals, organizations, still giving out, still reaching out to say, you know what, I can afford to, to give out this. We buy bags of rice, we buy, buy cartons of food um, in Domi, we go and share it out. We give food to um, health line, the healthcare frontline workers, a whole lot of things that individual organizations have done, donations made by uh, big organizations just to curb the economic uh, uh, and social effect of the pandemic. So um, we're now talking about, we're talking about businesses who cannot keep their staff and operations because everything is locked down. Incomes are not coming and not so many employees will be committed enough to say, okay, you know what, let me just hang on. When this business begins to recover, we all begin to enjoy as usual. Let's just tighten our belts. Not every employee is willing to do that. Everybody, of course, wants to take care of their families themselves. Everybody needs incomes, both employees and the business. So it becomes a vicious circle and it becomes a crisis indeed. They will talk about increasing inflation. So even the interventions of the government to curb the effect will have to you know, be moderated, will have to be properly managed so that inflation does not increase further. Some economists have also said maybe government should print money but that would increase inflation for that if it's not managed properly. So government just has to find a way to manage the taxes or that's the fiscal measures regarding taxes and levies and then the monetary measures regarding the interest rates, CDN interest rates and then printing of money and then other, other, other palliatives and then debt, borrowing, borrowing of money. Government just has to find a way to put to put a balance to all this so that it doesn't skyrocket to even worse financial situation for everybody. So we're in a crisis. So we actually need to be up and doing, to think on our feet, to pray, to tighten our belts, to re-strategize, see where we're going, do things better. So Talking about MSME statistics in Nigeria, we need to know, understand ourselves before we talk about what we can do. And that's why we feel we deem it necessary to share this information because it tells us what businesses have been doing in the MSME sector and we need, what we need to correct and do better during and post COVID-19 so we can grow better. So these statistics we pulled from the joint report of the National Bureau of Statistics, NBS, and the SMIDAN, they issued it in 2017. The very first one was issued in 2010, then again in 2013, and this is the latest one in 2017. So the definition for MSMEs, we're going to run through it now, because when you talk about MSMEs, it's a bit hazy on, unless you see the statistics. So the the report this medium defines micro MSM is micro small and medium enterprises so you have three categories micro businesses small businesses medium businesses so we've categorized this thing to the, this presentation into the three categories just so that we can throw shed more light on everything so for micro businesses what's the definition if you have less than 10 employees and if you have five million worth, less than five million worth of assets, excluding land and building, then small businesses. If you have your small businesses, if you your small business, if you have ten to forty nine employees, 
and then between 5 million and 15 million worth of assets, excluding land and building. Then you're a medium sized business if you have 50 to 199 employees, and then between 50 million to 500 million naira worth of assets, excluding land and building. Then if you have more than this, you have from 200 employees upwards, you have assets, machineries, plants, receivable, a lot, um, sorry, capital assets only. You have investments. When you accumulate everything, you have more than 500 million. Then you're a large business. So we're not talking about large businesses here. We're talking about micro, small, and medium businesses. So let's even look at this statistic again. If you have less than 10 employees, how many businesses in Nigeria have between up to 10 employees to start with? You have a lot. Then come up to between 10 to 49 employees. That's a whole a higher stretch. You would have saved a, a whole lot. You would have been doing business, become structured, not living on your business incomes. You would have invested money somewhere somehow and you would have been producing more there will be more pro productivity for you to need more than 10 or between 10 to 49 employees that means there's something they are doing there's productivity on ground so at when you become a small business that is when you begin to build wealth you can also measure wealth you can measure wealth by productivity by assets that you have so these are also pointers to productivity and asset, the number of employees and the asset base. So by the time you, you have 5 million to 50 million worth of assets excluding land and building, hey, you're getting on, on, you're on, on the road to building, you're building wealth already and you're building productivity. And then when you have more than 50 employees to 199, they're not just sitting down. There's, there's something they're doing, either producing goods or services. So productivity has been enhanced, wealth is being built. And that is when you, are, you, you, are, you know that, okay, you have a bit of buffer, the business is building wealth, and it's not, it's not just uh, trading and spending, trading and spending. And, uh, so, and that is when you begin to grow. So you can see the progression. So if you're just getting money and spending it, you will never be able to build the wealth that will propel you to be a small business or to be in a medium business. We can also do this analogy. If, if you're working and you start work newly, if you start work newly, except for some, some people whose parents or guardians or mentors actually sat down to say, you know what, this is how you're going to share your salary from day one. You're not going to spend everything you get, even, even if it's not enough. Because a whole lot of young people, before the salary day, you are finished spending everything. So you just live on earning and spending. So there's no savings. And then you struggle to get married, build a family. You find out that expenditure will also increase. And if you haven't built that culture of savings and investment, even as a person, and saying, you know what, no matter how hard it is, I cannot spend beyond this. We all have to manage. This is what we have. We have to live with it. Then you start, that is when, when from those savings, you start buying land, building, building investments, uh, opening trust for your children. Then you're building wealth as a person. The same thing happens with businesses. So spending has to be curtailed and business or personal finance structured properly with discipline so that we can grow. So by the time you, somebody that is disciplined works for 10 years, 15 years, you have reached the peak of your career, your any more, you 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 pass the crucial stage of okay, I want to marry wife, I want to train my children. Your children have grown. You you've had you built a lot of wealth around you, and then people begin to see you as a rich man. But it's years of savings and and discipline. The same the same thing applies to businesses. So number of businesses in the micro sector, micro business that is the smallest category of businesses, those that don't have employees and those that have less than 10 employees. We have 41 million, 400 and some, something thousand. Out of the 41.5 million 
MSMEs in Nigeria, 99.8% are micro businesses. So what are we talking about? This is where the issue lies. We, are, we were already in, in crisis before the COVID-19 started. So if we have 41.4 million out of 41, that's nine, almost everybody is within the micro business. So we're just trading a loan, not structured, not growing wealth. No matter how small we get, we can still be able to grow wealth and save and build capital, build trust in investors to even invest as little as whatever little amount they can invest. People will invest if they see that the business is disciplined. So 99.8% of us are not, <laughs> okay, let me just say, we're just starting. Then you have small businesses, point one seven percent the people who have started growing and who have some capital to hire and and have a large asset base of less than 50 million we have about seventy one thousand of them in nigeria that's what this statistics is telling us as of 2017 then the medium businesses we just have 1793 that's point zero zero four percent of msme so that's almost like very insignificant number so we we have from only this one that i've just read we've seen where our problems are coming from they said msmes are the worst hit because we don't build wealth because we don't have savings because we live on our daily earnings because we don't have structured businesses because we trade alone and that's where i go to the next slide so top industries a bit of comfort we have wholesale retail trade 42 percent for micro businesses we have agriculture 20.9 percent for micro businesses sorry, hello if i could just quickly say something okay hi sorry to i noticed a couple of people are just joining okay so please note your okay. questions um we would not we would not take questions now we take questions after the presentation and then uh um, you can just share your questions with us, so please just note it. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Vivian, please. Thank you, Fisara. Okay, so I was going through the MSME statistics and what we're doing, how, how are we structured, what are we, how are we doing in Nigeria. So we're saying top industries for MSMEs. Micro businesses, we have, we've, we've categorized them just like Smidan and NBS into three. We have micro businesses. We have small businesses and medium businesses. We've, we've just defined what they mean. What, what does it mean? What, what is a micro business? What is a small business? And what is a medium business? We just defined it in the previous slide. So what industries do we trade in? So for micro businesses, we trade in wholesale retail trade most, which is 42.3%. We do agriculture. Then we engage in other service activities, could be consultancy, technical, mechanical, engineering, whatever, self teaching, service, whatever it is. We have 13.1%. 13, 13 then we have manufacturers, just 9%. Then accommodation and food services, 5.7%. So in this COVID 19 crisis, wholesalers are affected by supply chain. Retail trade, mostly markets are affected. Retail trades that are working are the ones by the roadside on, on the streets. But major markets were affected and trade was limited. So we can see how we have been impacted. Then agriculture was also es was essential. And, but farmers were complaining of supply of feeds and the medicine and how their livestock were dying and, and crops. So they were also affected even though the trade was moving. Then we, also, we, had, we have other service activities, many service activities were not really making much. And here we don't have telecoms, we don't have people that sell internet or data, they are not in this league. They play in the large leagues, so we don't have them. And, they, they, and the banks too, they were the essential services that kept seeing some form of transactions all, all this while. Then small businesses, you have education as the top 
industry, 27%. Then something that I also um, did not mention is Smidan says that if you have um, it, if, if you, you need to categorize your business and you have a tie between a, number, a quantum of assets and number of employees, that the number of employees should take precedence. So if you have, um, let's say, 15 employees and you have assets worth less than 5 million, which you categorize you under micro business, the Smidan is saying you should be categorized under small business because you have 15, more than 10 employees. So number of employees takes precedence. And I also tied it to productivity. So because you have a good or service you're rendering that need, needs more hands to render. So small businesses, you have education more. You have educa education is at the top because of what they have so many employees. In schools, you have so many employees because teachers, uh, cleaners, um, administrators, a whole lot of employees are needed, but not all of them have those assets, excluding land and buildings. So that's why that could explain why we have more people in education under the category of small businesses. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they are rich or wealthy or they are doing well because they have more employees. Then you have manufacturers as small businesses, 23%, better than the micro businesses, of course, because manufacturers need plant and machinery, and they also need people to make their, their uh, outfits work. Then you have wholesale and retail trade, not many of them as compared to micro businesses. Please note that small businesses in Nigeria were just about 71,000. So when we say education is 27%, we're talking about less than 20,000 schools uh, that are small businesses. So um, we also have manufacturing, 23%, accommodation and food services, 8%, human health and social works that are in, uh, on that small business category, we have 10%. So human health and social works, they were also working, they were essential during this period. Then the education for small business was greatly impacted. So we can see how the economy has been impacted. Then medium business, when we talk about medium businesses, they are mostly manufacturers because of the asset base and then staff base. Then you have wholesale and retail trade, about 13% and then others. But medium businesses account for just about 1,700 businesses, MSMEs in Nigeria. Just 1,700 MSMEs are categorized as medium out of the 41.5 million. Okay, so that gives us a pointer as to, you know, the, we, are, we were not well before the COVID-19. So this issue of COVID-19 has caused this it's only making us realize how bad the situation has been all the while and we just ignored and we're just living on okay every day god will take care of us one day at a time okay then ownership structure that's another interesting statistics for micro businesses you have 97 percent who are sole proprietors what 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 do we mean by sole proprietors sole proprietors are people who are doing business alone like the, you're the owner, you're the accountant, the highest uh, complement of staff you might have, yeah, your family members, and then relations or boys from the village who are helping you and who are doing apprenticeship under you. So most decisions are taken by you. There is so much a one person can do if if your soul is so person you're in one man business that's interpretation so there's so much a one man can do if you don't have a structure it's just you you don't, you don't have an advisory board or a board of directors you don't have um um consultants a structure actually that lets you know that you cannot do this or that there are limits a structure that lets you know that your supply, your operations, 
your human capital, your cash flows, your investments, your spending has to be structured and you're answerable to someone, your accounting and finances. You have to produce an account that somebody will look at and say, we agree, we don't agree. So in, in the absence of all these checks, you find yourself just doing what you like. You know, you have all the power, but you don't have all the knowledge and capacity to grow a business that will transcend you or your generation. Then that is 97% of the micro businesses. Remember that micro businesses make up 99.8% of the entire MSMEs. So we're saying in essence that 97% of MSMEs in Nigeria are sole proprietors. So that is where the challenge lies. The structure is not good to carry a business that can grow and build wealth and transcend this category of micro business to something like medium business and then a large business. So we find out that many people just trade to survive, train their children, build homes, um, save a little for those who can save to take care of themselves in the old age. And then suddenly the people die and you never hear of that business name again. So under the micro business, you also have partnership as well. Just 2%. Partnership is when you're doing business with a group of people, your partners in that business, you have a partnership agreement, which is called partnership deed that is guiding you. So every, everybody can at least be accountable on the basis of the partnership agreement then others that were not categorized in the report they're just one percent so we can safely say that majority of businesses in nigeria are run as are one-man businesses then the statistics also say that 97.8 percent of these businesses are not even registered with cac that is nobody knows them if you're not registered with cac that means you don't have a name that is, you don't, you're, you're, you're not even legally operating as a business in Nigeria. The government does not know you that you're a business. So you just have a, a shop name or a, a, a trading name, and that is all. And somebody else can even use that your trade name to trade, and you can't do anything about it. They, in fact, there's no, you don't have a legal base. No Banks cannot even lend to you. Um, other investors cannot even come because where what are we coming to do? You don't have a, a, a legal business going on here or legally recognized business going on. Sorry. So 97.8% of MSMEs or, or micro businesses in Nigeria are not registered. Then to analyze the small businesses, the same issue, it, it is, we find the same issue of one-man business structure here 65 percent are one-man businesses sole proprietorships then 21 percent is private limited liability companies those are companies the same category was given for smes so we have 21 percent of um, when i say smes i've removed the micro i'm now talking about small and medium enterprise so small medium were categorized together under the ownership structure in the report we're reading from, which is the National Bureau of Statistics and Smidan Joint Report on MSMEs as of 2017. So small and medium enterprises, you have majority of, majority are sole proprietor, 65%. Then 21% is limited liability. These are the people who have incorporated the company different from themselves and they have shares um, that limited liability so if, if you if the business runs into troubles that it cannot handle you just not go beyond the shares of the business you recover your debts to the extent of the shares of the business and the owner or owners are saved then for uh, limited companies you need to have at least two directors then you need to have what is called corporate governance structure in place you need to have executive non-executive directors of equal numbers so one set is checking the other you need to have audit committee you need to have 
auditors auditing your account you must have audited accounts every year which you file to the cac a lot of things have been put in place by the companies and allied matters act to guide um, incorporated companies so it's actually the best structure for a business to thrive and grow except for service business some service businesses that are not even allowed to incorporate for instance accounting firms you're not allowed to have to be incorporated because of the the advisory you render is human beings who render the advisory so they would like to hold you responsible for the advisory you render to other businesses so for small and medium enterprises or businesses you have partnerships five percent faith-based six percent cooperative one percent so the the uh, pop, the company structure here under SME might also account for why they are SME, why they are bigger. Because small and medium businesses are bigger than micro businesses. So if you're incorporated and you have a whole lot of checks from the karma, that is the companies and allied matter act that you have to do, these things help you to structure your business better so you can build wealth around the business and grow better. That, that could be another interpretation why you have why they are in the category of small and medium businesses because they are growing because they have a better structure than just someone running a business as one man as you're as you're trading you're getting money you're already budgeting oh i'll use it to finish my house in the village oh i'll use it to buy that car okay let me just sell one of my cars i'll use it you know all, the, all those things there's no structure which has affected MSMEs even before the COVID-19. So these statistics are from uh, 2017, sorry, 2017 report. So continuing the statistics, sources of capital for micro businesses is personal savings, 61.2%, then family, 23.6%, why because you can't raise money outside of your savings because your business as we saw in the last slide is not structured enough to get funding from any serious investor or any serious lender for small businesses the same thing source of capital is personal savings 55.6 percent then you have more of loans that's for Small and medium businesses were categorized together. So it's the same thing for medium businesses. You have loans, 17.5%. So these people have a structure that can at least attract funding from commercial banks and microfinance institutions for them. So you can see the importance of structure in a business. Then family account for 11.7%, which is still quite high. So age of founders another interesting statistics for micro businesses you have 26 to 50 years these are essentially millennials millennials are the people who were born between nine, early 1980s and 2000 so these are the people who are just you know starting growing young families you know who are youths who are exuberant who might not have the discipline to save who have a lot of expenditure and then that's even cut some these millennials some slack they've had it rough before um these past few years entrepreneurship was not the major thing for nigerians it was work corporate corporate jobs it's just now that many people are beginning to go into entrepreneurship so a whole lot of millennials were in well well-paid jobs then you now have others who did not go to school who are in business that's probably why we have more of people in retail business because there's they didn't go to school so they could only trade in commodities so but this age um, um this age range 26 to 50 is an age where you spend more is an age where you have a whole lot of family responsibilities where you have a lot of expectations from peers you know to live up to standard so you find yourself spending just trade get money and spend you're not you're not investing in the business to build wealth so that is why many of of these people have stayed within the micro 
business category, never growing, enlarging, enlarging this group. Imagine, okay, let me also say the growth rate. The next, the next row talks about growth rate in number from from the 2013 report issued by Smidan and NBS. The growth rate for MSN is is as of 2017 was 12.1 percent. So they grew. This category of businesses grew more within these um, four years, from 2013 to 2017. So what about the small businesses? What's the growth rate? OK, people grew by 4.6%. Businesses grew by 4.6% over four years, showing that there's also progress and growth. Then medium businesses minus 61%. So people are crashing down from medium businesses to becoming smaller. So the people who were, the businesses that were medium in 2013 have fallen down to small. So, but we cannot blame these people because over 2015, 2016, 2017, the country has not been so, so financially buoyant. We entered recession, a whole lot of things have happened and businesses are struggling. So it's not only the fact that we are not structured, is about the enabling environment. What, what, what is the economy giving? You find people cutting prices, you know, except food prices. Only the food prices are rising because they are essential commodities. That food, food prices are rising, but your incomes are decreasing. Even the minimum wage, it took a whole lot of tug of war before it was implemented at 30,000. So a whole lot of economic struggles that could affect MSMEs apart from the structures that we run. The top challenges for MSMEs, micro businesses, you have lack of finance. Top challenge, 90.5%. There will be lack of finance because you're not structured properly to receive money. So put yourself in the shoes of the lender or the investor. You're not going to put money, unless you just want to give the person money just so that the person can just take it as a gift. Whatever they do with it is their headache. But if you expect something in return for the money you're giving, you have to check whether that investment is worthwhile, seriously. So if you look at a business that is not even registered with CAC, so it doesn't even have a legal structure, in the first place then you look at okay what's your business plan now so what do you plan to do what, what's the outlook what do you plan to do differently how do you go to market what products and services are you rendering differently what's the innovative approach who are your partners that you want to partner with to make sure that these things are sustained by the time you know you ask about all these things and they are not even existing you're not going to put money there so that's why micro businesses, which account for like 99% of MSMEs, are lacking finance, which is what we need now during this COVID-19. We need finance, we need funding, both from the ones we generate from within the business and from support outside. But who is going to support a business that doesn't have a structure, that doesn't have a plan of growing or paying back your debt or investments? You also have lack, um, lack of insurance for micro businesses. 96%, 96.6%, they are not insured. So they are not enabled to withstand shock. So if, for instance, your goods get burnt or get lost in transit, or you have theft, or the market burns, a whole lot of things could happen. And you just lose your business because you don't have insurance. You don't have protection. The business does not have protection. The employees don't have protection. So even if they die at work or in service, there's no life insurance for them. So uh, we're saying 96%, which is almost all the micro businesses. And micro businesses account for most of MSMEs in Nigeria. So let's understand how these statistics have played out into what we have experienced over the years and what we're now experiencing. And, you know, the crisis is even getting more more tight or worse now 
okay so you have small businesses you also have similar challenges small and medium businesses you have 67 percent lacking finance you have lack of business support services and business plans and lack of insurance 63 percent but not as bad as that of micro businesses so we can see that where these uh, statistics are getting better is is where you see growth so if these things are corrected you see growth so these statistics just tell us where we need to go okay so lessons learned lessons learned during post covid 19 well majority of the lessons we have learned comes from the slides i just shared just now the statistics and the explanations i just gave i didn't come up with, with the statistics this is what we are doing this is how we are this is what the government has done put together the report of where we are what we're doing and they've shared it with us so the statistics are real that is what we do that is the lesson we need to learn and that will drive what we need to do better going forward so i'll just retreat again on some points so over the last few months or last few weeks we found out that there's a clear definition between essential and non-essential commodities so this means that you need to be able to build a business around what people need not what they want there is the difference between customer need and customer want a customer needs food to survive a customer might not want a big car might not need a big car they will just they might not even need a car the person just needs to be mobile however it is they don't actually need a car so it's a want and if you need a car you don't have to go for a g-wagon you don't even have the money so there's a difference between luxury or what customer needs and what customer wants and when we're starting businesses the the uh, people always say the experts always tell you build your business and your business plan around what is essential what customers actually need what is the solution make sure you're solving a need there's a need you're solving build your business around it that way you you're sure that monies will come in so even though some of these deeds were even disrupted during this COVID 19 a number of them but the, let's say transportation for instance people need transport cab you know, to move around but even this period transportation was even uh, uh, disrupted because there was lockdown so but at least you know that people must move around even when the lockdown has been lifted people must move it's an essential thing people must take medication people must need health care people must eat food people now must use internet a whole lot of things that people must now do which is essential so part of the lessons learned and what we can do better is to build our businesses around the need let's solve problems let's see problems let's solve them a part a large conglomerate is solving problem by producing sugar spaghetti um cement all those things that are essential salt you need salt everybody must cook with salt and that's why they are huge they are big because those are small small things they don't have to be big you don't have to it's not a prestige thing somebody sells dog food in a particular vicinity and is selling out fast because she produces it with local raw materials and is good and more affordable and more nourishing to dogs and people around her even beyond the estate and vicinity where she is are patronizing her so but it's not everybody who has dogs but this is just an example it doesn't have to be something prestigious you don't have to be selling aircraft for you to know that you have arrived you can do something small within your community that solves problems for businesses and they will keep buying and you keep trading and you keep growing okay for instance i have there's this supermarket around us where we live they now have about five or six outlets they started with one small outlet supermarket and their prices were really really 
more affordable than even inside the open market. So a whole lot of people around this area were going there to buy things because they were selling affordable things and it had quality. And when you go in, you could buy raw food, you could buy um, groceries, you could buy packaged food, you could buy a whole lot of things, even household items, clothes and shoes. It was just a complete supermarket. Now, over a period of about eight years, they now have about seven outlets around this whole vicinity and they are the biggest. So that's the power of selling something that is essential and solving a need around you. So that's one lesson learned and something we all need to focus on. So we need to see where the economy is going. We need to be able to watch the trends. What are, what are, what issues, what are the problems that are coming out of COVID-19? How can we use our business structure to solve them? You, I'm not saying you should go outside of your business plan. You should stay focused, but, but diversify within the ambit of your mission statement. So you're not going to go into uh, tech, uh, selling technology if you're, if you're dealing in food stuff. It's not within the mission statement. You're, you're selling something already that is not related to technology. So why, and you can't mix technology into it by selling it. So you need to, either you, if you're not able to mix up those, those diversities in, um, in sales, you just have to incorporate a new business so you can take advantage of whatever opportunity you're seeing from the COVID-19. So you also need to be agile. You need skills to resilience. You need to be agile, competent, flexible in strategy. And everyone needs to help businesses, employees, the owners. Everyone needs to tend to the business so that the business can survive and then be able to take care of us again after COVID-19. So everybody needs to be fast, agile. You need to bring your A game, be competent, be flexible, learn, be able to adapt, be able to take decisions that are good in a, in a shortest time. You need reliable and stronger business networks and collaborations. Imagine if you had a strong network and you are importing goods you may not have to go there if for instance where you're importing from the lockdown is eased a bit they can still shop around for you package your goods send it here you will also collaborate with people go to market together people who offer similar services or are in similar industries with you don't see it as competition you can go to market together build stronger networks if you're if you're like the strongest person in your network you're the one that people are always coming to you're the one who provides all the knowledge, all the finance, all the direction. You're apparently the strongest. So you, you might need a stronger network where people stronger than you are. So you need to expand your network, build stronger, more reliable networks so that you can, together you can be able to navigate the COVID-19. So check the value of your network. What are they bringing to the table? What are you bringing to the table? If you're the strongest right now, you need to look out and look for another, another network where people stronger than you or businesses stronger than yours are. Then you also need to find a way to auto automate your business. For instance, if you have an online shop, you can sell in your sleep and all you have to worry about is how to deliver. Okay, so how do I deliver this to these people? Okay, the lockdown has been eased. I can deliver. I can go and get my goods from, from whichever market, then sell, deliver, and I can make some income. So you have to put your business, put structures in place to automate things so that you don't need to be there to do business. So that business can, can go ahead, even if people are not allowed to be there, even if there's lockdown, even if there's social distancing put things in place, then you need a solid structure to operate. You need to have a business plan that caters to what, you, what you're selling, the, what you want to diversify into, to take advantage of opportunities resulting from COVID-19. You need a business plan that shows you the milestones for your business. Okay, when we are five years old, we should be doing this 
when we get to seven years old we should go into this when we're 10 years old this is where we should be you need um a business plan that will guide you you know, no, no business plan is actually foolproof but it's just a guide it tell it, it's better to plan than not plan so it, those who plan actually end up failing much more those who do not plan at all so if you have a plan in place it's all also also tell you in advance how am i going to make it you have a um, plan based on statistics good numbers then you will come to numbers because you can't do a business plan without numbers so if you're running a business without a good accounting system even if it's the one that you need to operate by yourself you need a software to do your accounting. You can't do it on Excel because you're not an accountant. Even if you were, you, you did not go into business to do accounting. You went to business to grow your business. So you need a software, an automated system that you can use that were built by experts in accounting that will guide you in an easy way to put your numbers, make sales from there, make purchases from there, pay salaries from there. Then do all the operations, charge time, manage projects, manage your shops from there. So you can open it at any point in time and see, okay, this is how I'm doing, you know, this is the highest buying customer. This is the product that is selling less. This product, the stock has never diminished from the sales. This is the highest selling product. Ah, this is the customer that owes me most. Can you imagine? I still have receivables of over, over three months with this customer. You're seeing everything from a, a software. So many, I don't know why many businesses don't use accounting software or do their accounting and numbers. But these numbers will give you an idea. Am I going according to my plan? Am I getting it right? Am I failing? It's not because you have cash flow, then you say you have profit. Cash flow is different from profit. It's only when you have an, a, a proper financial statement that you see whether you're making a profit or loss whether you're investing rightly, whether you have cash flow, a whole lot of things that get clearer when you look at the numbers. That's why you need to prepare the numbers with a reliable accounting system. So you need to structure. And if you're doing, if you're doing your numbers, you'll be able to project. You have to budget because a whole lot of people are spending more because there's no budget. But if you have a budget in place that says, Within three months, we're not going to go outside this. And it's crucial within this COVID-19. You need to do your cash flow projections, your budget. You need to re-examine, re-evaluate, redo, review. And if you don't have an accounting system, you can't do it. Even if it's on pen and paper, it's still some form of accounting. At least start from there. But the best practice is use a proper accounting software. So, but you need to prepare a cash flow projection, a budget to say in the next three months, six months, what, based on what we are seeing now, what's going to happen. Then you check what, where are the costs coming from? What is taking up the most costs? What do we need to curtail? What do we need to uh, stop completely? How do we take advantage? What revenue yielding opportunity do we have? How can we get funding? So by the time you're looking at numbers, Hello? Hello? Hi, Vivian. Yeah. I think you muted yourself, but we can hear you now. Okay. Um, okay. So we've opened the chat box. If you would like to, while she runs off, please, um, just drop your questions in okay. the chat box, please. And if you also want to um, mm -hmm. ask a question, please signify and then we would unmute your okay. mic so you can ask a question but then let me just drop it in the chat box while she runs off thank you okay so where where did you hear last what what did you hear me say last you were talking if you have a good structure in terms of have a good um, accounting structure okay. for bookkeeping okay i think that's the last point for this slide yes okay so you need um, a structure in place so you can budget, you can budget and forecast, put your cash flow, your business expenses, your revenues, and you need when when you're looking at numbers, when when numbers are on the on a piece of paper, 
on your screen, you will be able to do it more than just doing it off your head and just hoping for the best. So that's why it's important to have a structure. Another thing that is important is insurance. You need to insure your business assets, insure your, um, your employees so that in case anything happens, you will not find yourself you know, regretting or saying, ah, maybe, you, maybe there is theft. Because during the lockdown, we heard about a lot of people you know, being attacked on the road where they on their way to deliver goods. So if so, something like that happens, you have insurance in place to help you to continue in business. So those are the safeguards you have to put in place. Then you have a good business plan in place. We talked about it. Diversify sources of finances on operations and supply. For your supply, you don't have to rely on international supplies alone. You need to diversify. Look for local supplies. And of course, if you diversify your um, uh, selling or se um, revenue structure, from that is the services or goods you're trading in, if you diversify and add more to it, you also, that leads you to figure out how you get the supply. So if you, if, if you were into, let's say, oil servicing and you decide to go into palm oil, for instance, palm oil export, it's still within that oil field, but this one is now agricultural full stop. So it's essential service which you can sell both locally and, and you can also export. So your supply of oil is just here in Nigeria. You can even get it within Lagos State or within the region. So diversify sources of revenues, diversify sources of supply, build stronger supply network, then operations as well. See how you can sell everywhere, sell online, sell offline, partner with people who are into core essential services, just to sell everywhere, network, engage in um, go to market together, with other organizations. Um, okay, that's basically it. Then you need to have financial statements that are up to date. It's part of the accounting and, and finance. Many people needed funding or are still needing funding during this COVID-19. They need intervention funds, but they don't even have financial statements to present. Somebody has been in business since 2009, 2010. That's like over 10 years ago. You've never had one audited account. Okay, now you come to me as a professional services provider. You want me to do your audited account for you. And you don't even have the funds to pay me to do your audited account because you have, you have not done it in so many years. And we still have to do a, whole, a number of years to get up to date so that you can apply for that loan. So you can see you can see how we've been getting it wrong. So assuming you had a proper structure, proper finances, you've paid your taxes up to date, you have your tax clearance, and you go to seek funding for anybody, of course they'll look at you, they'll know you're serious because they'll ask you for financials, you're presenting it immediately. They will ask you for your tax status, you present your tax clearance. So that, that means you're serious. And you won't have to go and spend extra money to get these things together to package your loan application because you've been doing it since. So that, those are the lessons learned. Then employees should put the business first. If the business is alive, salaries will come. You know, everybody should just tighten belt because it's not easy for anyone. Then ensure you register your business so you can start up properly, legally. Then strive to have a database of clients, customers, suppliers. Talk with them regularly. Build relations. Know the mindset of your customers. What do they want now? Where are they going? What are their plans? Oh, how are they even dealing with the COVID-19 crisis? Such conversations will give you an idea about, okay, this is what this client is thinking. Okay, let me position this by product or service to be able to meet the person at his point of need so they can buy from me. Things like that. Keep engaging. Then just call. How are you doing? How are you dealing? And the person will share some things. From there, you can find opportunities to sell. Then pay attention to changing trends in the economy. Where is the economy going? Where are the emerging opportunities? 
which collaborations are going on but stay within the focus of your business plan you don't have to go outside of your unless you want to close that business and start a new one to take advantage of opportunity then the structure remote flexible and online business conditions so the partnerships across board locally um, your employees put get them on board so that everyone will support structure um, things like schools now you need to structure remote learning find a way to add it to the curriculum before now home businesses were actually you know there but they were not very rapid uh, home homeschooling sorry people were adopting homeschooling especially the wealthy people and teachers will come to the house and teach their children but it wasn't rampant so now schools will have to find a way to even diversify maybe put it in their curriculum if you want to do remote from home they register if you want to be a day student register if you want to stay in the body all those things were there before but we need to be able to structure remote and flexible business uh, conditions so the all these things are in line with what i've said earlier engage customers uh, pay attention to where the government is going what are the comments by relevant government agencies for instance frs cbn and other regulators what are they doing what are they bringing out how will it impact your business are there incentives to take advantage of then uh, speak openly to your creditors those you're owing your your suppliers your bankers your investors you need to everybody needs to say the truth to each other to structure more negotiate better terms for payment of your debt then um, improve your skills improve your transferable skills skills like time management uh, resilience team organization innovation all those things are very important right now because over the past two months a whole lot of decisions were taken for instance in our business we had to keep a lot of things kept changing and we had to keep changing as well start okay how do we adapt to this not only us a whole lot of people experienced it before you could finish with this one another one has come out that has changed what you just decided the other day so you also need to rework it rework the plan and launch so you need these skills resilience mental strength to be able to you know continue um, block out the distractions just keep focused make sure what where you're going is where the economy is going and you position yourself well then organize your team and uh, time management is important as well look for consultants look engage cons there are consultants now that offer freelance or virtual consultation so you don't have to hire somebody if, if you don't need an employee you don't have to hire and keep paying salary you can engage freelancers, contract staff as you need or as they do the work you pay. So you can give the business some, some space to recover and try enough to, to have all those fixed costs around. So cut off a lot of fixed costs that you can do without. Pay bills in installments. Do not pay bills in, in, in lump sum. Don't go and pay for one year subscription if you can pay for monthly subscription. So you take it bit by bit one step at a time but you need to learn to manage yourself manage people with those with those uh, soft skills communicate better reach out to suppliers customers bankers be better you don't have to fight with your bankers no di uh, find diplomatic ways of dealing these are transferable skills these are soft skills that we all need to learn at at the times of crisis like this then lastly you need to take it easy because everyone has been affected one way or the other you're not the only one everyone even governments countries everybody is affected we read how many countries are affected already so you're not the only one so just take it take things easy then com in conclusion yeah in conclusion just to wrap up um, you need to be healthy, stay safe and healthy, keep everyone around you safe, your family first, before the business, make sure your family is safe and healthy and you put protections in place. 
then you embrace technology because it automates things. Technology makes things effective and it automates. So you don't have to be there. People don't have to be there because we've seen the importance of things running smoothly even when there is lockdown and nobody to attend to it. So that's why technology is important. Grow your network, build stronger network, collaborate more. You, you can't, we, we can't do it alone. We need to share, collaborate. Then look at your sources of revenue. How do you sell? What do you sell? How can you restructure to take advantage of where the economy is going? And your supply chain and processes. Let me diversify my supply chain. I can sell some things that I buy with the, around me while I will also sell some that I import. So when I don't have import coming in, I can always begin to sell from my local uh, supplier, the one I get from my local suppliers in a period of travel ban and lockdowns. That will work instead of just closing your business completely because you can't import. Then you restructure your finances. I've, already, I've said much about those ones, finances. Make sure you are able to attract funding, both from customers, because you can rate you one well, number one way to raise funds for your business is through sales. If you sell, you raise funds. So you need to restructure it. Find a way to raise funds to sell more, to sell better from sales before you go to external sources or before you start selling your assets or your investments. Then your human capital, you need to relook re sadly because you have people who are just not innovative or flexible to come with you or to come with the business. People around you should be able to be flexible. At least not everybody is gifted, but you have people who, who are there, who are always there providing support, providing ideas, helping out, changing. And you say, okay, the business is going to change plan. And the person is coming on board with you not because if you're if you're overburdened by the economy and you find yourself also overburdened by non-performing staff is a whole lot of stress so you need to at some point you look and ease off some stress where you can so you can fly light and go better so thank you so much that's all we have we'll now take questions thank you again for the opportunity Thank you very much, Vivian. So we'll take questions now. If you have questions, please drop it in the chat box. Oh. Raise your hand so we can unmute your mic. Vivian, you made a very interesting point about um, having uh, a very honest and open communication with um, with your partners. You talked about, you know, don't fight your, you said don't fight your bankers, you know. So <laughs> I'd ask you and you understand that this is a very difficult time for our customers and we've come up with, you know, different palliatives to actually help push on the effect of the pandemic. So in about two weeks, we're going to be having a session with our MB and our SME customers to actually discuss um, those palliatives and, and actually see if there are other ways we can um, further help them impact the, the effect of the pandemic. Okay, while we wait for the other question, I am just thinking, like, um, okay. I don't know if there's a um, specific insight you'd like to share for school owners, because I was going through the uh, participants and we have a, a number of school owners that are registered to join. Um, even as of yesterday, uh, there was a new announcement um, for some of the sector and economy to fully open, schools are still on lockdown. So mm. how can, what, what can school owners, what can they do, you know, so if you have any advice for them. Okay. Yeah, so for school owners, they've been on lockdown, but I know that a number of schools, in fact, several schools have adopted technology. Some people even send questions through WhatsApp. Some people do Google Meet, like uh, my kids in secondary school, they do, they use Google Meet. And um, we've had to pay some fees, some school fees, though not everything because or they, they were living in the boarding school, so we didn't have to pay for the boarding fees because they were not there. So we had to pay for the normal schooling, schooling fees, which they charged us, which wasn't too heavy. And they've been schooling online through Google Meet. 
Then the younger ones who are still in primary schools, they have um, they, they send their work through WhatsApp every day. So mm -hmm. there's a WhatsApp platform where they share questions, then we give it to the children, they write it. There are even health workers who are the parents of these children. So you see them submitting their works in the night, maybe around 10 p.m. Maybe uh, last week we saw some people submitting the entire week's work on Saturday. So boys, it's, it's something. At least we paid some fees. So these schools can, can continue their skeletal operations online with the aid of technology. But then something is um, there's something that must be done for schools. They need intervention. Their teachers are not being paid full salaries, but some of them are not even paying at all because they are not doing any learning online. So they should try to adopt some form of learning so they can at least make small money to pay some teachers to sustain the teachers. The teachers might have to find alternative sources of income since they are not working full time now. They should maybe attach themselves to selling one essential good or the other something like that to, to be making some small incomes before the schools fully resume but the government will, or the banks will need some to give some schools let's say overdraft because while the two students are not there who is maintaining the schools you know when the schools reopen you need to do a lot of maintenance a lot of fumigation a lot of structuring to make sure that the environment is safe for children. So they will need some form of help to, for, for some long funding to take care of those things. Then when parents start paying, they can begin to offset the loans. And then, like I said before, they might put a structure in place where, you know, because if you had 1,000 students and you had 50 in a class, and you're required not to have more than how many number of children in the class, definitely you're not going to be able to contain everyone. So there has to be the option of who wants to still stay back at home and do remote online uh, learning. So you might find that schools will have to also create that part of homeschooling as part of the uh, curricula, where you have day students, you have boarding students, then you have home students who are learning online until everything is back to normal. So that's just what I what I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we're going to unmute Pastor Ya Oluwa Shell. You can ask this question. I, I was just talking about the area of uh, Miss Mrs. Vivian mentioned. Uh, that is the area of online learning, which of course it's very uh, cool in some areas. Some can of course adopt that. But there are areas where online learning is just impossible. In those areas, what can one do? For instance, where I have my school, uh, we we made some moves to uh, get one or two you know parents and ask them, uh, okay, if you want to organize online teaching, how can you uh, you know be part of it? And then we told them those things that are involved because, of course, a lot of things will be involved. The parents also have to get data. They, they, have, they need a very good phone and some other things. But those parents are, of course, saying that those things are not there. That what they are start looking for now is money to just eat. Mm -hmm. And then they look up to when the lockdown will finally be over. So in that case, what, what can one do? And, of course, we are not... Making money, money is not coming in. We have mm. uh, debts to pay. We have a lot of things to do. In fact, as a matter of fact, I discussed with some of my teachers. I said, uh, I, I, uh, as long as this lasts, we still need to still pay them because they are not doing anything. Mm -hmm. But all they say, the money is not coming in, and we want to see how the cushion be fed by making sure that we do something, but we don't even know how to do it because. The parents are, they are the audience, they are the people we give service to, render the service to. So how, how can one, uh, you know, work in that very premise? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Fasoya. I understand your concerns you. because you. even even from from here, for, the, for our children to attend the online school, we've had to spend monies to buy computers, set up internet, unlimited internet, because as they are working, they are playing games online. You know, so you can't keep buying data. 
a whole lot of stuff that parents need to consider and it's not everybody who who can afford it so something that can also be done is why not give them make make them make the parents come to school maybe on saturdays or sundays to pick up notes for the week they can pick up notes work for the week in hard copies they, but they need to pay some fees to be able to sponsor that for that to happen they will pay you some fees to prepare the notes to prepare the marking scheme correction so they bring they come and take it on 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 a weekend their children will work on it all through the week they can even give notes for the entire term which is what my children's secondary school did they have even notes for the entire term so people who cannot log on to check they still have the notes somewhere in their google they all have google emails so you can do for the entire term or weekly so you can track progress so maybe every every Saturday or every weekend, the parents can come, take the notes, take the work to be done for the week for each class. By the next weekend, they submit it. You give them correction. They take new ones just to keep learning going. That's something I would, you know, that I, I, I would think of if if the online learning is not is not feasible. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so just give me a sec to unmute the other participants. All right. Thank you, Vivian. Um, I'm just trying to read another question. As a result of the effect of the lockdown, having evaluated your cash flow and discovered you cannot meet up with your monthly repayment as usual, what do you do? Okay, you have to be able to negotiate with the people you're paying. So it's either you're cutting down on services or supplies, or you're negotiating better terms, or you're raising funds from outside. You can raise funds from family and friends to support you. You can raise funds if you have a good network. That's why I talked about the importance of having a good network of people that you can, they can support you and you can support them, no matter how small. So either you cut down on expenditure and stop buying or using that service, or you negotiate terms to say, can we spread payment? Can you give me some months of moratorium or some break? Let's see how the economy turns out. Or you, you ask for funding from outside, or you partner with essential service or, or trade traders, service or trade uh, goods providers, so you can sell and raise funds and be able to cater for your expenses. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Um, I'm not sure if the participant is a, is a customer of the bank. If you're a customer, please join us. We're going to be sending out um, emails and SMS for you to join the webinar, the exclusive webinar with the MD and our SME customers. It would be a good one if you could join so we can all deliberate and share the palliative measures that the bank has put, has put in place. So we will go to the next question. In your opinion, can you advise an entrepreneur to start a school business this period? Yes. <laughs> If I okay. if, if I will use myself as an example, I would just if I want if I was in, uh, were to be interested in the education sector, I will just build something out of the ordinary, maybe an app, a learning app, and I'll see how I can engage the people in my network to start with it first. In fact, it's something I have to think through, but I see an opportunity in problems, so I I will. I would love to go in to take advantage of the problems, all the problems that people are now asking me about now. I'll, I'll bring all of them together and I'll see how to solve them. And that becomes my business plan. So, yes. Okay, thank you, Vivian. So, another mm -hmm. question. Thank you, Afisaya, for your total moderation and facilitation. Vivian, for an excellent evidence-based presentation. Okay, so I think that's the comment. So this is the question. 
Evidently, it seems global business disruption is a cyclical reality that MSMEs need to live with. For example, from global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009 to COVID pandemic of 2019-2020. By this, what can MSMEs in Nigeria do to prepare to navigate through such future disruptive periods? Given that governments may not have effective rescue or palliative plan to support important sector of the economy. That's, I think this person has about two questions, so that's the first question. Okay. So that first question, I have tried to answer throughout my presentation, but I'll just pick the most important thing, the po most important, just, important yeah. point for okay. me now is to say, you have to do sell what customers need no matter any time in the future people will not stop eating food for instance no matter what happens no matter what disruption comes up or what recession people will not stop eating food for instance you also have to monitor trends where is the economy going now people are talking about digitization is not africa i don't think africa is ready or we have all the data or the internet connection to to go automate fully everything but at least begin to look into it for the future begin to work in within the future and not in the current so that anything that happens again you'll be sure your business is positioned to continue to sell okay thank you thank so look at day Bajomo wants to know what are the major key components of a good business plan. Okay, major, the key components of a good business plan is, okay, you have a target market. What are you selling? What, what are you selling? What's the need you're solving? That's the first step. What are you going to deal in? Then who are your target market? Who are you selling to? How many are they? How much money can they give you? Then you that you're, you're selling to them, what's your capacity? How much can you supply? What do you have? What's your capacity to supply to meet those needs so that you can generate those funds? Then if you don't have the capacity, how are you going to build capacity? What is your competence? What's your experience? How, how many employees? Who are you going to be needing? Which partners? Then you have to find a way to go to market. How am I going to market? How am I going to sell it? What am I going to do differently that other people, if I want to go into fashion, for instance, people are, in, a whole number of people are in fashion. So what, what is the problem within the fashion business that I will come and solve differently? So those are the important components. Then projections, numbers. You have to have numbers, reliable numbers of how much you aim to make, how much you aim to spend. That will drive your capital for the business. So you project your capital in the short term and in, in like one year, two years, three years. Let's say within one and a half year, you, you should start making revenues of your own. So you need to project how much funding do I need to get me up and running on this business and sustain operations for the next one year or two. So then the numbers will help you to determine, okay, am I going in the right direction or not? What am I going to do to mitigate? What tools do I need to, to power my operations? So those are, those are the basic things about this. What are my milestones? When should I do this? At what point should I implement this? If things go well, if they don't, what's my plan B? What's my plan C? Or even plan D? So those are, those are the components of a business plan, which we all have to be able to, to write down or note down or prepare before we Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Pastor Ya, Ola Sukhomi wants to know how often do we expect this place? I'd like to commend the efforts of Action Microfinance Bank for this wonderful platform. We would, ideally this is every month, but like I said, we have a session in two weeks with the MD and some of our um, MSME customers. 
And then also, um, we're going to have another one later by the end of the month. You, we have your details, your SMS and your email address, your phone number. So we'll be sending out invites to you. Um, we also, by July, we're going to be having a session on mental health and COVID-19. Like, like Vivian said, you know, this is, has been a very difficult time for everyone. So we're going to be having a doctor and a psychologist um, online, and they're going to be sharing quick and easy tips for us, for us to manage this crisis. You know, how can we manage stress? How can we manage um, anxiety and all that? So that will be in July. But please follow us on social media at Action MSC for all the updates on the upcoming episodes. So if you have any other questions, please, um, you can still drop your questions or raise your hand so we can unmute. Before we close, we are going to run another poll very, very quickly just to um, find out, just for you, for you to share your feedback with us on the, on the seminar. Um, has it been helpful? Has it not been helpful? What can we do differently? And um, how did you hear about us? It will take only a few seconds, so please just take the poll. And like I said, if there are any other questions, please drop your questions or raise your hand so we can unmute your mic. Okay, the poll is up right now. It will just take a few seconds. Please just um, take the poll. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're just waiting like a few minutes. Do we have any other questions? Just a sec. Okay, things have been moving. Hello, Nelson. Yes, good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for, for meeting me. However, you have taken part of the question that uh, I asked. Um, okay. But there, yeah, there are some that are still left. Like the second question I asked is, uh, is uh, the minus 61% downward trend in medium enterprises against 4.6% upward trend in small uh, enterprises is quite revealing. But then I would have uh, want the our um, able facilitator to specifically, you know, give advice on how such a future trends could be, you know, uh, what can be done to avert future trends, uh, downward trend in medium uh, uh, enterprises. I wouldn't know whether you got the question from yes. the statistics she presented. I, I got the question. Uh, it, it, yes. Yes. What could be done specifically? Y yes. What could be done specifically apart from the general uh, recommendation you gave to avert such downward trend in medium enterprises? Okay. So. Uh, okay. Thank you. So, something Go else ahead, to Vivian. something else to watch out for. As it just came into my mind as you were asking this question is. We once met uh, a mentor, um, I don't know if you know her. So she was talking about too much cash, that too much cash is not good because you might have too much cash, even though you're complaining that you need funding as a small business. But when people now give you the cash, you might end up spending in unnecessary things. She talked about when she started her food processing business that they had too much cash and they ended up buying machineries that they didn't even need. So such things can also contribute to medium businesses because you're not having, the business is growing, you have a solid business plan, you become a medium business, your asset base is growing. So people can lend to you. In fact, bankers will even be begging you to take money, take money. So if you're not careful, you begin to run inefficiently begin to put money because you have the money and you have the edge you begin to run inefficiently in operations that will not yield anything so if operate if you spend so much on on capital uh, goods or items and you don't see anything in return of course your your balance sheet is going to go down 
your net asset is going to go down because there's no money, no matching revenue is coming in. So that can happen if the operation is no longer efficient or if the market you're playing is no longer essential. Let's say you're manufacturing something that a local alternative has taken over. No, sorry, uh, that another alternative has taken over and you're still manufacturing it and something else has come up and it's taking over that thing. So you find out that you need to you'll be able to re-strategize, put your machinery into use for something that you will sell and make money. Then I also talked about the economy, you know, uh, within 20, from 2015, 2017, it wasn't easy. And that report was coming from, 20, uh, that statistic was coming from 2017 report. So it wasn't easy for many people. I know a number of customers that took loans. They took huge loans when the economy was buoyant. And 2015, a lot of um, contracts were cut off, you know, even from, from the UK, from the World Health Organization. Things happened that we don't really know about, but manufacturers took loans to buy huge machineries and contracts were cut off. So you find yourself at 2017 without contract, with huge loans to pay, with machineries that are not operating because what you bought them for, they're no longer producing. So such a business is bound to crash you know, to become minus. So those are the things that may have happened. Thank you, Vivian. So Thank we'll you. take our last question um, and then we'll close. Um, on Milton Perk Elijah. Yes, I want to say thank you for the wonderful opportunity. Thank it's you. been very afflictive. Um, thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Um, I want to ask in form of a question, briefly. Um, the analysis as to SME, micro, small, and medium, okay. and how they can be able to prepare themselves for, for a bankable business after this uh, pandemic was very clear. However, I want to ask from the perspective of Action Micro Finance Bank, what should be the requirement for an SME to qualify for support, both um, in terms of technology as it stands now, in terms of learning, in terms of um, financial support and all of that, so that we can survive this phase that we are entering as post-COVID uh, uh, situation. Because, you know, before now, a lot of us do not actually qualify for support from this uh, commercial bank by virtue of the, the standard they, 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 they create, and then uh, they want people who are already made that they support. But now we're looking at the grassroots. And uh, if we have content and we are ready to package, what should be the step, the KYC process for us to be able to qualify for this kind of support that uh, would help us jumpstart and uh, start a, a, a standard living? Okay. Thank you for that, but uh, I think I, I would allow Fisaya to answer that because, you know, I don't work with yes. Axion, so Axion should be able to tell what they require. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Um, what, what we require, like, like I always say, is once, once we're done with this webinar, please just send a DM so we can continue the conversation. Um, and then we can follow up. But um, what, what we need is for you to be in business. We do not um, um, offer loans to start up. So you must be running your business. You must have um, a physical address, a physical shop. Um, so this is where I sell my thing. It must be a lock-up shop. And, and we would also require that you share with us your, um, your details. So like your turnover, even with other banks. So this is what I've been doing with ABC Bank, in terms of my turnover, this is how much I have there. We would also do a stock evaluation, we would come to your, um, to your store, to your, to your shop, and then we'll do a stock evaluation, and we'll do um, other evaluations as well before we then um, give out the loan. Before we, we... Hello, can you hear me? Sure. 
very pleased. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to especially thank Vivian for taking time out, out of a busy schedule to join us. Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm happy to have impacted all these number of people. So we, we, can, we can also connect with... Hello? Sorry. Sorry, are can you talking? Can you hear me? Okay, all right, I thought you were still speaking. No, I was saying that I could see the, the polls, the results from the polls, and it's quite good. Like, a yeah. lot of people feel that they've been yeah. impacted positively, and I'm very grateful to you to have been part of this. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. For the participants, you can also follow up with Vivian on LinkedIn as uh, Vivian Chigose. She's on LinkedIn as well. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining us, and we do hope this was an insightful session. Like I said, we have another episode coming in about two weeks between our MD and our SMA customers. Also be focusing on mental health in COVID-19 and practical tips that can help you thrive um, in a crisis. How can you manage stress, anxiety, all that. Thank you so much. Hi, Fisayo. See you next time. Can I just say something? Can I just say something? Please go ahead. Yeah, yes, I wanted to say if you want to reach us, if you need professional services in any of the areas, tax audit accounting, um, or business advisory or, or, or software for your business, you can get through to us when you send an email to clients at vm.com. That is or you go to our social media handle VI hyphen M VI hyphen M professional solutions. You search for us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, we're there. Or you send an email to client, C-L-I-E-N-T-S, at vi-m.com. So um, we'll get back to you once we receive it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vivian, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice day. Bye.